Good afternoon, everybody. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Dorothy Noyes. I'm the director of the Mershon Center for International Security Studies here at The Ohio State University, and I welcome you to today's lecture from Mark Lynch. Mark Lynch is Professor of Political Science and International Affairs at George Washington University, where he directs the Middle East Studies program of the Elliott School. He's also affiliated with the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and the Center for a New American Security, and of course, he is a visiting scholar at our own Mershon Center. He's a leading English language voice on the contemporary politics of the Middle East, with a special focus on the public sphere of the Arab world, and his claim to expertise is supported by a deep knowledge of the language, extended field stays across the region, and engagement with scholars from the region. Lynch's early work on the state and the public sphere in Jordan, which was the subject of his first book in 1999, acquired urgency in the wake of 9-11 with the rise of new media at regional scale and the formulation of transnational Arab public opinion. His 2006 book, Voices of the New Arab Public, Iraq, Al Jazeera, and Middle East politics today countered a narrow post-9-11 stereotype of the Arab street. From 2011 forward, Lynch became one of a group of academics consulted by the Obama administration on the uprisings of the Arab Spring, a phrase he is rumored to have coined, at least by Wikipedia, uh, and he published two major studies of the hopes and failures of that period. In 2012, the Arab Uprising, the Unfinished Revolutions of the New Middle East, and in 2016, the New Arab Wars, Uprising and Anarchy in the Middle East. As he's continued to examine the geopolitical shifts around the Syrian and Palestine conflicts, as well as the spread of Islamist militant groups across the African continent, he's become increasingly concerned with the analytical implications of methodological choices, and one of his seven current book projects is a discussion of how exactly we should conceptualize the Middle East or any other geopolitical region. Lynch has been an energetic creator of public goods in and beyond political science, from state-of-the-field textbooks and state-of-the-question edited volumes to the politics blog The Monkey Cage and the Middle East Political Science Podcasts, now in their 13th season. In 2010, he founded POMEPS, the Project on Middle East Political Science, a network to develop the field, advance its engagements in policy and the public sphere, and mentor young scholars from the region. More recently, he's been developing an African spin-off, partly in the recognition that the Mediterranean and the Red Sea are not boundaries but conduits of communication, and to help develop an infrastructure for the burgeoning interest and importance of African politics. The Mershon Center has been fortunate to welcome Professor Lynch as a visiting scholar in a moment when his expertise is acutely wanted. An article by Lynch and his frequent collaborator Shibli Telhami in the current issue of Foreign Affairs sits at the heart of a vigorous debate in the U.S. foreign policy establishment over the viability of a two-state solution to the Israel-Palestine conflict. Today, Lynch draws back from the immediacy of that conflict to its regional impact, speaking on Gaza, Israel, and the Middle, and Middle Eastern regional order. Please welcome Mark Lynch. Thank you, thank you, Dory. That was, that was a very generous introduction. And I am delighted to be here uh, at the Mershon Center at Ohio State uh, for this year and for next year. Um, it's a, a big topic that I've been asked to, to speak about and one that I think for almost anybody, not just people who focus on the Middle East, but I think more broadly, it's something which has, I think, gone to the center, uh, to the very heart of our understanding of what is our role in the world, what can we do with great injustice which is being done everywhere around us in our names, with our money, and uh, where many of us who are US citizens are, are necessarily in a democratic system at some, at some level impl uh, implicated 
implicated in the choices we make and the policies that we pursue. And as such, um, I'm not here to offer any particular policy uh, recommendations or the like, although I'm happy to. You can ask me in q and I, I have I, all kinds of ideas. Um, but what I want to do here is actually take a bigger step back and kind of think about where this war in Gaza came from, where it fits into the broader Middle East, and where it fits into American efforts at establishing regional order over the course of decades. Um, because obviously, uh, the war in Gaza, which began on October 7th, didn't begin on October 7th. It's the culmination of a very long sequence of events, um, which lay at the heart of a much broader set of international alliances, structures, power relations, some of them institutionalized, others not. And it's impossible to understand anything that's happening in Gaza today without understanding it within this broader context of decades of history. I think um, it it'll come as no surprise to any of you the idea that uh, Israel, Gaza, the West Bank, and the broader Israeli-Palestinian conflict is central to what happens in the Middle East as a whole and is central to global politics. It might surprise you that in many ways that seemingly basic claim has been deeply contested in recent years, especially within US policy circles. There's been a general idea over the course of the last decade or two that the Palestinian issue had lost its salience, that Arabs didn't care anymore about what happened in Palestine, that in a sense, the, the, the problem of Palestine, which had always been seen as one of the major obstacles to a stable Middle East under American leadership, it no longer served that function. And in fact, I would argue that over the course of the last several administrations, it had, beca it had become something of a central pillar of their thinking about the region um, that you could pursue normalization between Israel and Arab states and more broadly an American-led regional order without addressing the Palestinian problem, without creating a Palestinian state, without finding any form of justice um, or any form of solution which could meet the basic needs of the Palestinian people. This was the major innovation of the Trump administration with its pursuit of the so-called deal of a century um, and its pursuit of and its successful pursuit of normalization between the United Arab Emirates and Israel um, towards the end of its administration. And the Biden administration, um, which campaigned against, the, uh, against Trump's approach to the Middle East, upon taking office, adopted it in every way. Um, and has governed basically exactly as Trump's second term in terms of his priorities and approaches to the region. Uh, the Biden administration said that they were going to prioritize human rights and turn Saudi Arabia into a pariah state over its murder of Jamal Khashoggi and its war in Yemen. And instead, it has spent the majority of its term up until October 7th attempting to broker a normalization agreement between Saudi Arabia and Israel, which would complete Trump's moves towards uh, the so-called Abraham Accords. Um, and this is, a, a, this is something which might be shocking to people who approach this as a matter of partisan domestic politics. Again, I'm happy to go there if you want to, but that's not the point of this talk. The point is to say that there are structural continuities in America's approach to the region, which are rooted in something that goes well beyond the American domestic political arena, and Gaza very much lies at the center of that. Gaza, of course, um, was originally, in 1948, part of the two major parts of mandatory Palestine, which did not come under direct Israeli occupation, where the West Bank in, in East Jerusalem became part of what was then Transjordan and quickly became the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, where the citizen, the people of the East Jerusalem and uh, the West Bank were granted Jordanian citizenship and made fully equal Jordanian citizens. Um, in Gaza, they came under Egyptian military administration and stayed there until 1967, when Israel conquered both Gaza and the West Bank in Jerusalem, uh, creating a second wave of refugees, which then spread out once again, around uh, the Arab world. After 1967, Gaza was ruled directly by Israel for the first time, and it stayed that way all the way up until uh, 2005. Um, despite the Oslo Accords, despite the emergence of the Palestinian Authority, it remained under the direct security control of Israel until Ariel Sharon in 2005 decided to redeploy Israeli forces outside 
of Gaza and create a security perimeter, a wall essentially around Gaza, which was then essentially used to create a draconian blockade system of sanctions and control by which Israel was not directly policing the inside of Gaza, but was instead controlling everything which went in or out of Gaza, by land, by sea, or by air, which over the course from 2005 to, to, to 2023, Three um, was essentially one of the more draconian sanctions regimes um, on earth, comparable to what we see, for example, of the US sanctions on Iraq after 1991 and, and various others that you, I'm sure you could all imagine. The upshot of this, of this particular arrangement which was put in place after 2005 was that Hamas, after the democratic elections of 2006 and then a seizure of power of 2007, came to govern Gaza, but within the confines of the external control exercised by Israel. As such, it maintained absolute, oh, there, there goes my map, oh well. You guys memorized it, right? There's gonna be a quiz. Um, space bar? Oh, okay. It wasn't that important. Um, okay, anyway, the, the point though is that Hamas was able to maintain its own internal control over Gaza and was actually facilitated in that control by this Israeli blockade and this Israeli sanctions regime. In other words, Israel was indifferent to who governed Gaza as long as Gaza basically stopped causing it problems. And Hamas, over the years, became seen as a useful mechanism for doing so. Once it controlled Gaza, it was in a sense normalized. It didn't become a state, but it became a state-like actor, one that had a population to feed, it had services to maintain, it had both territory and people that it needed to govern. Israel found that it could rely on, on Hamas to do things like crack down on, on more militant organizations like, um, like the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, that uh, where it was useful, they could count on Hamas to prevent any kind of violent march on the security perimeter, basically to act as, their, as, as kind of their delegate in the same way that the Pal it's okay, don't worry about it, in the same way that the Palestinian Authority acted in the West Bank. And that this would basically become something which you know they didn't Israel didn't necessarily like, but they found to be useful. One of the, the kind of the news items that you've probably seen circulating around in the media and the blogosphere is this idea that the state of Qatar uh, was funneling money to Hamas over the last ten years. This is true, but the reason it was funneling money to Hamas is because it did so in coordination with Israel, because it was found useful to make sure that Hamas that Gaza didn't collapse. Funneling money to Hamas was a way of making sure that you would maintain the basic su survivability of the Gaza population without having to deal with its absence of a state or its absence of any kind of longer term solution. And that was essentially the status quo. One of the things which happened as a consequence of that is that Hamas developed an elaborate system of ways of staying in power and keeping control, as one would expect from any rational actor in such circumstances. That included developing uh, the, the famous tunnel system that you've seen so much written about over the last uh, four months, uh, the system of tunnels that were largely designed for smuggling in and out of Gaza. Uh, through the border that was policed by, e uh, by Egypt, um, and ways to basically get in not only weapons, but also uh, food, medicine, stuffed animals, backpacks, anything that you would smuggle in a normal environment came through those tunnels. Um, this is important because Hamas controlled those tunnels and took attacks off of everything that went through it. Again, everybody knew it was happening. It allowed them to consolidate control, and everybody was more or less okay with that status quo. Now, you might say, oh, but there were wars all the time. And indeed there were. There were repeated outbursts of conflict between Hamas and Israel over the years. In 2009, there was one that was so bloody that it provoked the, um, the, the um, establishment of a UN uh, investigation led by Judge Richard Goldstone to investigate uh, potential war crimes carried out by Hamas and by Israel in that campaign. Again, in 2014, there was one that was so bloody and so destructive that um, I actually published an article in the Washington Post asking if the political science of the Middle East could ever be the same after what had happened in Gaza. Turned out that it could. 
um, and that is a recurrent theme in uh, what happens in Gaza. There's a script in Gaza. The wars always happen more or less the same way. Tensions bubble over. Hamas starts shooting rockets into Israel. Israel responds with massive aerial bombardment, which kills a bunch of civilians, destroys infrastructure, targets some particularly um, desirable uh, military uh, targets. The Israelis called this mowing the grass. Uh, that they would just, you know, destroy enough in a little, you know, kind of a week of bombing that kind of knock Hamas down a peg. And then the U.S. would impose a ceasefire and everyone would go back to normal. Hamas would claim victory by showing that they had survived against this Israeli attack. Israel would take a hit with the international community by, and everyone would be able to score political points against them. Israel wouldn't have to reinvade and reoccupy Gaza, which no rational Israeli leader wanted to do because of the cost that that would entail. And in a sense, those wars, those repeated episodic wars, were in a sense part of this status quo, which was widely seen as sustainable, if not desirable, by both Israelis, Palestinians, and the United States. On October 7th, I, again, we can go into this more if you want. Uh, this isn't the main focus of this talk, but I'm happy to speculate and go in more detail if you'd like. My suspicion is that Hamas expected roughly the same script to play out as had happened previously. They had an audacious plan to get across the security perimeter with all of the, the innovations, what they've been practicing with the paragliders and everything else. And my assumption is that they, they did hope to strike a really sensational blow by, by penetrating the perimeter, getting into the kibbutzim and some of the southern villages, killing a bunch of Israelis, retreating with hostages, and then waiting for the inevitable Israeli retaliation, which might go for a week, kill a few thousand people, and then at the end of the day, Hamas would be able to emerge and say, we did it, we struck this blow against Israel, and we, um, and we survived, and then everything would go back to normal. Why would they expect that? Because it had happened again and again and again and again and again. And there's every reason to believe, again, I don't know this for sure, but there's every reason to believe that they expected it uh, to go roughly the same way. But in a sense, they went too far or things went too far over the course of their attack on southern Israel. What ended up happening was one of the greatest strategic shocks to Israelis since 1973, I would say. Uh, the 1973 war where they were taken by surprise by a coordinated assault by Egypt and Syria combined with Saudi Arabia wielding the oil weapon at, in support of their political aspirations. Now it's worth noting that 1973 actually represented an existential threat to the state of Israel. It actually didn't because there was no way the United States and the Soviet Union would have allowed the actual conquest of Israel. But this was an invasion by two powerful nation states backed by Russia um, with Saudi Arabia behind them. This was a conventional war which actually threatened in a, in, a, in a way that's understandable to mainstream realist political scientists, a threat to the security and survival of the state of Israel. October 7th did not. I mean, it doesn't even come close. Hamas didn't have anything like that kind of power. Um, it, it didn't threaten anything beyond that southern strip of Israel, and it didn't represent anything like a coordinated assault by multiple states um, in a conventional war involving thousands of tanks b battling in the desert and the United States and the Soviet Union engaging in nuclear threats. Um, nothing like that. But it was a psychological shock to Israel like that like has not been seen since 1973. I would say arguably greater than the Intifada in the 1980s, greater than the second Intifada after the failure of the Oslo peace process, because it penetrated what had emerged over the course of decades of this sense that Israel was beyond all these things, that in a sense, Palestine didn't matter anymore, that they had achieved security um, recognition, and that they were no longer at risk of this kind of thing. It penetrated and punctured the sense of of security and invulnerability, which had become deeply ingrained within Israeli society. Um, and the shock to that system, those of you who followed this, any of you who have friends in Israel, who've talked to anybody from Israel, if you follow their media, you'll understand that this is not normal, that this has, uh, that this has fractured the Israeli psyche in ways that go far beyond anything we've seen before. And we have to take that into effect as we move into the second part of this talk, which is going to be about the regional effects of this, possible end games, and what's likely to happen. Rational approaches 
to what Israel should do based on the balance of power, American pressure, um, international uh, outrage and the like, simply don't apply right now. Israel is not in the kind of psychological state which, which is conducive to compromise or to retreat or to taking criticism. And it's a really important thing to keep in mind. What they did, as I think all of you know, was to launch an absolutely unprecedented full-scale um, attack on Gaza, which is not really well described as a war because there's nobody in Gaza really capable of fighting back. Uh, there has been, of course, skirmishes. There's a lot more of the kind of hand-to-hand -hand combat taking place in the kind of urban quarters of northern Gaza, especially early in the conflict, than you saw in the mainstream media here. There was a lot of that kind of thing going on. But really, these were just holding motions. These were kind of guerrilla tactics, tactical retreats. When, when, when Hamas had the chance to counterattack and, and attack a brigade that, was, that had dropped their guard, they would do so. But this was not a clash of army against army. This was an assault by a force, Israel, which had complete control of airspace, the land, uh, balance of power completely in their favor, and in general, a complete disregard for human life and for civilian infrastructure. In fact, what became quite clear early in the conflict was that civilian infrastructure and the civilian population was the target rather than something to be protected. And the large-scale mass dispossession of Gazans and the complete and utter destruction of their entire civilian infrastructure was not a byproduct of the war, it was the conduct of the war. It was quite intentional, and uh, northern Gaza basically does not exist anymore. Uh, the entire northern Gaza, its cities, its hospitals, its schools, its infrastructure have been completely destroyed. They simply don't exist anymore. And uh, perhaps those are going to be rebuilt as Jewish settlements. Maybe they'll remain depopulated as a buffer zone. We don't really know yet. But the point is that you've had the systematic destruction and displacement of an entire population. Um, almost 2 million Palestinians live in Gaza, 2.2 Palestinians live in Gaza at this point, more like 2.1 million, um, and it might be getting closer to 2 million. There's a reported 30,000 dead. Uh, that milestone was passed yesterday. Um, that is a radical undercount. The Gaza Ministry of Health stopped being able to actually count casualties months ago. The UN gave up long before that. Um, even that number, 30,000 number, doesn't include the people who have simply disappeared, buried under the rubble of bombed out buildings. Um, it doesn't count people who they couldn't identify with an ID card and tag to the, uh, to the system. I would say that a conservative guess would be that there's 50,000 dead at this point. Um, the official estimate is that 70% of the dead are women and children. Um, uh, I would say that if you, if you take the higher estimate, I would say you're probably looking more like 80%, 80, 80 to 85%. Israel claims to have killed 9,000 uh, Hamas fighters. You must understand that they count any male between the ages of 16 and 50 as a Hamas fighter, whether they're involved with Hamas or not. Um, and so that 9,000 is not an estimate of battlefield deaths. This is a count of adult males um, who, uh, who are confirmed dead. The scale of devastation goes well beyond that um, because of the complete destruction of the hospital system um, and the blockade, which prevents the entry of any food and the destruction of things like water sanitation facilities. Um, there is uh, not just incipient famine, according to the UN agencies in question, it is now an actual famine with people dying of hunger in what they call the most rapid onset um, famine in the history of, in recorded history. Um, and many, many more tens of thousands will die of famine, of disease, of all, all preventable. Um, but uh, the decision has been made to allow this to continue. It's entirely plausible that the ultimate uh, casualty, the, the ultimate count of the dead of Gaza will exceed 200,000. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if it was more. Um, right now, 1.4 million Gazans are amassed in a tiny little desert strip outside the Rafah crossing into Egypt, and Israel is now planning to attack that final enclave um, with 1.4 million people living in tents who have literally have nowhere to go. Egypt has built a gigantic wall uh, to prevent them from entering Egypt. Northern Gaza is off limits, and all that's left is the ocean. Um, and everybody, including the United States, has been urging Israel to not carry out that attack on, on Rafah. 
they have insisted that they plan to do so anyway, and if so, that would be something going even beyond the, the horrors that I've already uh, described. Israel has declared its war aim to be the complete destruction of Hamas and the end of any possibility of Gaza again being uh, the, the, um, the, the platform for attacks on Israel. This goal is by acclamation impossible. It, it simply cannot happen. Hamas has already reestablished a presence and control in areas of northern Gaza that have been declared cleansed. Um, the, its leadership has barely been affected. Um, its tunnel system continues to be operative. And there seems to be virtually no world in which H Israeli war, uh, war aims are met uh, without basically the complete removal of the, of the Palestinian population, which many people believe is the actual objective of the war. And we can talk more about that um, in Q&A if you'd like. So with that then as kind of the long preface to, to all of this, let me talk about the regional implications of all of this and how this plays out within the broader region. The first thing to mention is that Every single actor in the Middle East wishes that the script that I gave you a few minutes ago is what had actually happened. There is no state in the Middle East that actually wants a war with Israel. That includes Iran, that includes Syria, that includes every state actor. They do not want a war with Israel, and if you look at the pattern of Iranian behavior in particular, what you will see is its attempts to de-escalate, to avoid um, any kind of escalation which would lead towards itself being targeted in the war. Um, and that's a really vital thing to keep in mind. Every Gulf state, every neighbor of Israel, even Israel's adversaries would vastly prefer that this be contained. That's why they're pushing for a ceasefire. That's why they're, that's why they're supporting uh, UN resolutions trying to bring about a ceasefire. And that's why they're willing to talk about things like post-conflict reconstruction. They are extraordinarily worried about the spread of the war. And this is when, kind of where the title of the talk comes in. Everybody asks the question. In, in, in policy engagement, think tanks invite me to talk about these things. People want me to write about it. The two things they want to know about are, tell us about the day after the war, and will the war spread? My answer to the first question is, that is an extremely stupid question, which I can't answer because there is no day after. The war hasn't ended. It's not going to end anytime soon. And thinking about the day after is simply an excuse for not confronting the war that's happening in front of your face. So don't ask me to write about what whether we should have a parliamentary or presidential system in elections in Gaza as a way to avoid talking about the fact that 10,000 people are dying a week um, by policies that you're supporting. So, you know, the, the, the day after discussion is, in a sense, a red herring. Um, I made a lot of friends in that foreign affairs piece uh, trying to point that out, um, but that's okay. Um, but the question of will the war spread is also a dumb question. I mean, it's a great question, but the war is already spread. It's already a regional war. The question is not, will it spread? The question is, what will be the effects of that spread? Are that, is that spread containable? And what will the Middle East look like after, um, the, after the shooting ends? So let me quickly kind of review, and this is where that map would have been useful, but I, I think you all have a general sense of the geography of the Middle East, so I'll do my best. Um, where has the war spread? So let me start with where it hasn't spread yet. Where it hasn't spread yet is to th three of Israel's closest neighbors, where all three of the leaderships in question are living in mortal fear that escalation is coming, which could lead to the downfall of their regime. One thing you need to understand about the leaders of the Arab world, which are not different from leaders any place else in the world, is that what they want more than anything else is to stay in power at any cost. Regime survival is their number one priority. And in the bordering states of Jordan and Egypt, along with the Palestinian Authority and the West Bank, the overwhelming priority um, is to stay in power. This is why in the West Bank, Abu Mazen, the, the so-called president of the so-called Palestinian Authority, is willing to remain in power despite the fact that the Palestinian Authority has been proven to have absolutely no ability to protect its own people or its own territory as Israeli settlers have rampaged across the West Bank and Jerusalem, seizing territory, attacking villages, 
um, you know, basically uh, breaking through all red lines, which once gave some modicum of normal life to Palestinians in the West Bank, that's all gone now. The Palestinian Authority has lost any reason for being, and yet Abu Mazen refuses to step down and continues to meet with international actors as if he had any relevance um, to what was happening. Generally speaking, Palestinians, there was a recent survey and people were asked like, uh, you know, the usual questions you would ask. Support for Abu Mazen didn't break 5%. Um, when asked, should Abu Mazen resign, it was like 85, 90% said yes. Nobody cares. I mean, Abu Mazen doesn't care. There was no real consensus on who should replace him. Interestingly, Hamas did better in the West Bank than it did in Gaza um, in these surveys. Um, but in general, there's a recognition that the Palestinian Authority had absolutely no um, weight at all. In Jordan, uh, King, uh, King Abdullah of Jordan, uh, one of America's closest allies, has been frantically saying to anyone who will listen the urgent need for a ceasefire. If you know anything about Jordan, you know that it's been shaped by subsequent, by, by a series of waves of refugees which make up the majority of its population. In 1948, uh, it took on the major wave of Palestinian refugees. In 1967, it took on a second wave of Palestinian refugees from both the West Bank and Gaza when they came under Israeli occupation. In 1990, 91, and then again in 2003, it took on major waves of Iraqi refugees. And then after 2011, it took on a major wave of Syrian refugees. There's a general feeling in Jordan, which has almost no water, very few natural resources, um, and a broken budget, that uh, another wave of Palestinian refugees coming from the West Bank and Jerusalem would overwhelm the state and probably lead to the overthrow of King, King Abdullah. Now, keep in mind that they're all, the King Abdullah of Jordan, just like his, his father, uh, King Hussein, always says they're on the brink of overthrow. He never gets overthrown, and there's a, there's a real crying wolf, uh, uh, I think, approach to listening to Jordan, complaining that its, that its regime survival is in jeopardy. But this time it is. Um, if there were a reoccupation and an Israeli uh, annexation of the West Bank and mass expulsion of its population into Jordan, I see very little uh, uh, resilience or capability by which uh, Jordan could resist, could, could survive that in its current form. Um, which is not lost on the Israeli settlers trying to bring about that outcome, who would like nothing more than to see Jordan turned into the Palestinian state. For those of you who don't know, Jordan has a peace treaty with Israel that it signed in 1994. The terms of that peace treaty were essentially very, very, very simple, unlike uh, Israeli-Palestinian negotiations. On the, on, the Palest on, on the Jordanian side, they offered peace with Israel. What Israel offered Jordan was an end to claims that Jordan is Palestine and a recognition that Jordan is the Jordanian state and not the Palestinian state. That's the only thing that sustains the peace treaty with Israel, and that is what is now threatened by the possibility of the reannexation of the West Bank. Um, and so for Jordan, they're freaking out. In Ramallah, Abu Mazen doesn't really seem to be freaking out, but that's because he doesn't seem to really care about anything. Um, meanwhile, in Egypt, um, which is Israel's strongest and most important ally in the Middle East ever since the Camp David Accords um, in the late 1970s, early 1980s, its primary strategic partner in policing Gaza, but not just policing Gaza, but its primary strategic asset in the entire Arab world, um, uh, the, the president, uh, General uh, uh, Fatal Sisi, is absolutely living in fear. Um, he is a nationalist who fancies himself a new Nasser for some reason, running an extremely repressive, violent, autocratic regime which legitimates itself around a discourse of Egyptian nationalism and Arab nationalism. If he is unable to prevent the mass expulsion of 1.4 million Palestinians from Gaza or is forced to start shooting at them and, and ends up being complicit with Israel in the large-scale massacre of Palestinians, there's a wide understanding this, that this could be a mortal blow to what remaining legitimacy the regime has. Egypt is in the middle of a massive economic crisis largely of its own making. Um, its, its economy is in free fall, its currency is in free, in free fall, and the Houthi blockade of the Red Sea, which I'll speak about in a minute, has slashed Suez Canal revenues by half. Um, 
It has no margin for error, and it has no ability to deal with a million or two million Palestinians suddenly swarming into the Sinai Peninsula, whether they're held there in holding pens, like, uh, like the Israelis talk about, or whether they're allowed to go on farther into Cairo and the urban areas of Egypt. Egypt considers this a regime threatening threat, or a regime survival threat, correctly. And that's why you're seeing Egypt behave in, in unexpected ways. We've heard Egypt speaking about suspending the Camp David Accords and the treaty. They're not going to do it, most people think. But even speaking about it is something we haven't heard in decades um, and, and should be taken seriously as an indicator, not that it's likely to happen imminently, but an indicator of how seriously Egypt takes this. So those are the border states that have not, these, these, are, these are dogs that haven't barked yet, or they're barking really loudly, but the things haven't happened yet. But the war has spread to at least four theaters, um, and where there are frantic efforts to keep it under control. The most important of these is Lebanon, where there's been a steady expansion of the exchange of, of uh, missiles coming from Hezbollah and uh, bombing coming from, uh, coming from Israel, which has led to the large-scale, almost depopulation of northern Israel as people flee the risk of, bombard of, of Hezbollah missiles and of South Lebanon, where people are experiencing kind of quite intensive bombardment um, to which they've become, uh, unfortunately, quite familiar over the years. Hezbollah thus far has attempted to maintain a very rigorous tit-for-tat approach to avoid escalation. There's no evidence whatsoever that Hezbollah wants the war. Many of you might remember on October 7th that many people were afraid that this was a coordinated attack where Hamas and Hezbollah were going to simultaneously attack Israel, which would be uh, Israel's greatest strategic nightmare in many ways. Hezbollah has shown that that was not true um, by attempting to keep some level of restraint in, and, and de-escalation on that border. It's getting harder and harder to do so. Those of you who followed the news carefully might have heard that uh, a week ago uh, there was bombardment in South Beirut, which was a significant escalation. And then two days ago, there was a bombardment uh, in, in Baalbek, in uh, kind of northeastern um, uh, Lebanon, uh, which is kind of an Hezbollah stronghold, but far from the border. Again, a major escalation. There are a lot of voices in Israel who are now stating that they want a war with Hezbollah. There was a recent poll carried out by an Israeli uh, public opinion survey firm showing that something like 60% of Israelis wanted a war with Hezbollah, leading several major newspapers to publish clinical exposés of exactly what a war with Hezbollah would actually mean, given the size and uh, sophistication of its military arsenal. Let's just say it wouldn't be good. Uh, I, I can talk more about it if you want. The point is that Everyone to this point has been trying to keep that border at some level of controlled tit-for-tat uh, exchanges, um, but it is getting harder and harder um, to sustain that. The longer these things go on, the easier it is for someone to get lucky or unlucky, as the case may be. Iron Dome fails to stop an Hezbollah missile, which Hezbollah expected would be intercepted. It hits a school and kills 100 kids. Now Netanyahu has no choice but to respond. Full-scale war follows. It's so easy. And we've been lucky so far. I mean, if you look at what's happening on that border, you might, might not think it's lucky. Trust me, we've been lucky so far. Meanwhile, in Syria and Iraq, you've seen a coordinated a, uh, a campaign by Iranian-backed and also local Shia militias uh, targeting the U.S. military bases and the, mil and the U.S. presence there, um, explicitly justified in terms of uh, the Gaza and U.S. support for Israel in Gaza. They are also doing this in pursuit of long-held goals of ending the U.S. military presence in Iraq and Syria, and to everyone's surprise in Jordan, who knew that there was, uh, there was actually a U secret U.S. military base in uh, northwestern jo uh, northeastern Jordan, um, which was there basically to support the series of U.S. bases, most importantly the Tanf base, which uh, 
uh, I'm sorry, it never, I, it's, this isn't a funny topic, but it will never not be funny to me that we justify our presence in southern Syria as a way of, of, of breaking up the Iranian land bridge. Um, because land bridge is funny, right? Because it's a road. You can just call it a road. It doesn't have to be a land bridge. But at any rate, we maintain a little known military base on Tanf on this land bridge. And we had a secret military base in Jordan providing logistical support to the base in Tanf. And everybody expected the militias to attack Tanf. And instead, they attacked this secret military base in Jordan, killed a bunch of Americans. That could have been the, the basis for significant escalation. We carried out an exceptionally unusual bombing campaign uh, in Iraq. Uh, we, we assassinated several militia commanders on the streets of Baghdad in residential areas. And again, what happened was the militias stood down. They don't want escalation. Uh, they stood down, and it seems like things are sort of under control for now. How long can that last? Nobody really knows because these things are really unpredictable and hard to contain. What we do know is that it's becoming increasingly likely that the U.S. presence in Iraq and Syria will ultimately become a casualty of our support for Israel in this war because the, the political dynamics in Iraq are now overwhelmingly in favor of U.S. withdrawal, despite the fact that the prime minister of, Iran, of Iraq would very much like us to stay because he's desperately afraid of a resurgence of ISIS activities in Western Iraq. Iraq, but that's not going to matter uh, if the politics keep going the way that they are. Without our presence in Iraq, our presence in Syria is unsustainable, and um, we easily see that end quite quickly. Whether that leads to a resurgence of war, again, these things are hard to predict in the, in, in the specific and easy to foresee in the general. And finally, there's the one that people really pay attention to because it threatens you know, things we care about, like oil. Um, and that is that the Houthis in Yemen have carried out a remarkably successful blockade of the Red Sea. Um, and if we had the map, I would point out for those who you know, are familiar with the shorthand of the Middle East, we're not talking about the Persian Gulf here. We're not talking about the Straits of Hormuz. We're talking about the Red Sea. Um, but it affects the entire area. They started targeting ships that uh, were allegedly uh, re it related to Israel in some way. They expanded that campaign. The U.S. decided to create a naval coalition to protect shipping. Almost nobody wanted to join it. Um, and uh, the U.S. then began bombing Yemen, uh, getting joining the long line of, of countries that like to bomb Yemen. Predictably, this bombing of Yemen has had zero impact on Houthi capabilities, behavior, or anything else. The blockade continues. As I said, Egyptian revenues are way down on the Suez Canal, and uh, again, the Houthis are using this as a way to consolidate and expand their power inside of Yemen. This is a political winner for them, and they're likely to continue doing it. Again, largely containable. And here's where I'm going to kind of wrap this up so we have time for questions. Why has it been containable so far? So far, it's been containable for, t for a couple of big reasons. The first is that the state actors who could make a decision to escalate either don't want escalation or uh, lack the capability to do so. Um, the implicit part of that is that they remain in power. In other words, the reason that Egypt hasn't escalated, that Jordan hasn't responded, that the Gulf states haven't gotten involved is because they remain in power. If they are no longer in power, or if they perceive regime-threatening popular mobilization because of their failure to act, that could change. Either of those things um, are beyond the control of the strategic planners of the war. We might be able to offer military aid or threats to Egypt to persuade it to do things in the Sinai Peninsula. If a massive wave of popular mobilization hits the streets of Cairo, as we proved in 2011, we are helpless to do much about that. If someone assassinates the King of Jordan because of his silence in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the face of what's happening in the West Bank, uh, we don't really have a plan B. Um, there's a lot of things that haven't happened that could happen, but the big basic thing is that so far, there haven't been revolutions or failed states, so the state actors remain in charge. And B, those state actors, for now, do not see a self-interest in escalation. And that includes all of them, on all sides. The Saudis, um, 
despite the fact that the U.S. continually tries to get them to normalize relations with Israel in spite of what's happening in Gaza, they're saying no. They clearly want to normalize with Israel. And once the war is over, they probably will. But for now, they're simply putting that on hold. What they're not willing to do to this point is to add an oil embargo to uh, over Gaza. They have not tried to deploy the oil weapon. They have not tried to get involved in any kind of escalatory dynamic. But I will say this. I'm no fan of Mohammed bin Salman. If you've read any of my work, you'll know why I'm not allowed to go to Saudi Arabia anymore. But and I think his foreign policy around the region has largely been destructive and poorly conceived. But he's also been very good at reading Saudi domestic politics and has done a tremendous job of consolidating power within Saudi Arabia. When you see him behaving in unexpected ways in the foreign policy realm, it's likely because of what he's seeing in the domestic realm. And what he's seeing in the domestic realm is a population which cares about Gaza a lot. And that is affecting his decision making in ways that are really easy to see. Um, and in Saudi Arabia, as opposed to some of the other states of the Gulf, that really matters. A broader tour of the horizon, two other you know, kind of regional great powers in the Gulf, Qatar and the UAE. The UAE gambled a lot on the Abraham Accords with the argument that normalizing with Israel would give it influence over Israeli decision making. That has proven to be completely false. And the UAE is now in a position of having normal relations with Israel that are manifestly a liability rather than an asset. The main thing the UAE is trying to do is something to watch very carefully. They are trying to position their man in Palestine, Mohammed Ahlan, to replace Abu Mazen as the, as the president of Palestine. They very well might succeed in doing so if they're willing to put a few billion dollars behind it, which they, they probably will be. Um, and so that, that will be something to watch very carefully. That's what the Israelis want, and the UAE might be willing to go along with it. This will expose them um, to regional pressures in ways they've never faced before. Um, but that's the one thing for you to keep an eye on. Meanwhile, Qatar has, um, again, they've maintained their position as the primary mediator between Hamas and Israel, facilitating the negotiations over hostages, hostage release and ceasefire coming under um, attack uh, for that in all kinds of ways that are very familiar in Doha. But in general, they haven't really changed their policies very much. Um, and they probably feel the least exposed in terms of popular pressure, but the most exposed in terms of international pressure coming from Israel and from certain parts of the United States. Meanwhile, Turkey is doing what Erdogan in Turkey has always done very, very well, which he's saying a lot of pro-Palestinian stuff. He's blasting Israel for its genocide and everything else, while meantime maintaining completely normal military, economic, and political relations with Israel and hoping, hoping nobody notices. Turkey doesn't want escalation, and uh, they're playing the game exactly the way you'd expect Turkey to play it. And then meanwhile, Iran, and here's where, where I'll end, um, Iran has been, as I said, probably the biggest surprise to many people in all of this. Rather than trying to deploy its entire proxy network to bring about the final battle with Israel, it has attempted to modulate and restrain that escalation um, by turning it on when it's useful, dialing it back when it's not useful. And it's been actually uh, getting many people quite frustrated. People who would be quite keen to see resistance to Israel are saying, where is Iran? Where is Hezbollah? Why are they not um, acting the way that they, we know they can? And I think that's a real hint to where Iran sees all of this. They see, they see big parts of regional public opinion falling into their laps. They see this as really increasing their position in places like Syria and Iraq, consolidating actors in Lebanon and, and, and Yemen, and generally improving their foreign policy profile. That all goes away if there's an actual war. And that is basically the line that they are trying to walk. They want to win public opinion. They want to consolidate their positions within these states that I've described. But they don't want a war which is going to devastate their already shattered economy, possibly bring about the overthrow of the Islamic Republic. It's the last thing they want. And so they're trying to keep things under control. But again, that can only go on for so long. So anyway. All of this then is a way through this tour of the horizon to say there are good reasons why we haven't yet seen escalation. But that can lead to a real sense of complacency. Um, that just because something hasn't happened yet, it never will happen. And I am much less confident about that. 
I am not predicting total war. I am not predicting a whole series of state revolutions and failures. I think people set the bar too high on what counts as change in regional politics or international relations. Um, and so where I, I would suppose leave this part is simply to say that everything has already changed. The Palestinian issue has changed in fundamental ways. There's no going back on that. Some of the key dividing lines in regional politics are gone, and, and some of the new alliances that are forming are going to be playing out in coming years. Um, things could get a whole lot worse. We could get the expansion of the war into Lebanon. We could see overthrow in Jordan. All these things could happen. My point is that even if they don't happen, we've already seen meaningful change comparable to 2011 and the Arab Spring. Um, that's already happened within regional politics, and it's only just begun to see how it unfold. Let me stop by then saying, what does this all mean for the United States and for U.S. policy? And again, this is not a talk where I'm going to advocate any particular U.S. policies. Um, I will simply say that this has posed a really significant challenge to the U.S. position within the Middle East in ways that I think we, we basically understand but maybe don't appreciate enough. Any American president would probably have behaved the way the Biden administration did in the first few days of the war. Um, and Biden's, you know, kind of full-hearted, emotional embrace of Israel after the October 7th uh, uh, atrocities was, in my opinion, entirely justified, fully warranted, and I think played extremely well. And people understood it. Um, People find it harder to understand his continued support for Israel um, as the magnitude and scope of the humanitarian devastation with the absence of any political end game has become increasingly clear and why the Biden administration has been so determined to avoid a ceasefire, to refuse to use its considerable leverage over Israel, primarily through weapon sales. Um, you know, basically Israel ran out of bombs a long time ago. If the United States stopped providing them, they literally would not be able to bomb anymore because they'd be out of bombs. Um, Biden has been unwilling to use that leverage. Um, and uh, it's gotten to the point, and this, this is one of the most mind-boggling things I've ever seen um, in diplomacy. Um, I've seen a lot of mind-boggling things, but this, one, this one's right up there. The U.S. is now floating a plan to airdrop food and humanitarian aid into Israel, I'm sorry, into Gaza, um, because Israel won't allow uh, the hundreds and hundreds of trucks filled with aid across the border crossing that won't allow them in. Just think about that. Israel, our closest ally, which is totally dependent on us, we can't even get them to open the humanitarian crossings to allow in this aid, so we're considering airdropping rather than actually exercising leverage over them to do the obvious. That has been noticed. I have seen a Middle East angry with the United States many, many, many times in my career in the Middle East. The rage at the United States over the invasion of Iraq during the Intifada. There's, you almost factor it in as background noise that Arab public opinion is hostile to the United States. This is different. This is incandescent. And it's not limited to the Arab world. It's global in scope. And I think that uh, certainly in Washington, in my town, people seem to be really unable to fathom how much this has affected global and regional perspectives of the United States and how inexplicable it is to so many people that the US won't push for a ceasefire. Because, and here's where I'm going to stop where I began. There's a script in Gaza, and it always ends with the U.S. imposing a ceasefire. Israel does its bombs bombing for three days or for a week. They're waiting for the United States to step in and make it stop. They're not going to stop on their own. That's not the script. And for some reason, the Biden administration has simply refused to do that. And until they do, this will continue. And that is horrifying to me in many, many ways, but, and I can't really explain it, but um, that's where I will, uh, that's where I'll stop. So thank you. We have uh, some time for questions. Let me just call your attention to the fact that the event is being recorded, and let me ask you to keep the questions brief and considerate. The students will bring mics around. I've got the microphone. Oh, I've got it. 
you're, you're taking a big picture look at the Middle East. I'd like to take an even bigger one, which is, do you have some explanation why the Middle East is such a mess? Um, you know, if you're looking at it from the standpoint of 1945, mm -hmm. you'd say here's two of the richest countries in tradition, Egypt and Iran, who are going to obviously make it big time. Uh, smaller countries like Lebanon will probably figure it out. All those cases, all those places are basket cases. So is Syria. Uh, so is uh, Jordan. So is uh, Iran, Iraq, and so forth. Uh, just why is it such a mess? So you look at the same time at South Korea, you're going to say, man, that's a mess. It's been just come out of, uh, out of uh, Japanese colonialism. It then gets into the world's worst war. It's in the worst war since World War II. And it has incredibly crappy leadership. And my next car is going to be a Hyundai. Now, why is that? Why, why, am I, why, am I, why, am I, why am I buying a car from the Middle East? Or anything, even toothbrush. John, I, I, I can't explain why you're going to buy a Hyundai. I, I wouldn't, <laughs> I, I can't endorse that. Um, uh, you know, on, on the big, I don't want to like, I don't want to take up too much time because this is a huge question, but I would say that, you know, there's like two dimensions of it that I would highlight. Um, the first is your economic question, you know, because you're right. If you go, you go to like 1960 and you say, look at comparative regions, and you would say, by most indicators, the Middle East and East Asia, um, for that matter, much of Latin America, looked quite comparable in terms of the level of development, the levels of education, uh, profiles, and all that sort of stuff. And today, they're not comparable. Um, I, I would say the standard answer that Middle East uh, kind of experts would give you, there, is you know it's obviously oil the distorting effects of oil economy um, and uh, you're familiar with all of this uh, kind of the resource curse the Dutch disease which is not just limited to the oil producing states because it also created an entire oil economy based on labor migration and and remittances in places like Egypt North Africa and the like which basically allowed these states to kind of survive without having to develop, uh, you know, kind of export, you know, export industries, um, a productive middle class, all those sorts of things. Um, so that, that would be the standard. I'm not an economist, but that would be the standard answer you get on the economic side. On the, the, the broader political side, and uh, I don't want this to sound like a cop-out, but I do think that there is a very profound effect of geopolitics on this, that basically that uh, the, the presence of Israel, the importance of oil, basically made the Middle East too important to the U.S. and the Soviet Union, and then later to the United States. And especially after 1990-91, for all of its talk about democracy or whatever in, in some of our administrations, the reality is that the United States has, has been the guarantor of the survival of autocratic regimes in the Middle East um, from the beginning. It's, a, it's not just a Cold War legacy, it's also kind of the legacy of the U.S. primacy after 1990-91, and that's allowed them to avoid a lot of the kinds of uh, pressures that would ordinarily, you know, if you go outside the Middle East, have led to democratic transitions, like you saw in Africa, like you saw in Latin America, like you saw in, in East Asia and Southeast Asia, I would say that the United States was the primary kind of retardant on popular pressure and discontent leading to regime transformations. Um, people have all these explanations for why the Middle East didn't, wasn't part of the third wave of democratization, and they want it to be about Islam, they want it to be about Arab culture, they want it to be about all these things, and they miss that obvious strategic factor. The U.S. didn't want democracy in any of these countries because public opinion was deeply hostile to its policies, and it had a whole set of friendly autocrats who would maintain order, and that's what we opted for. Um, and it's, it's, it's really funny when you go back and you look uh, at, uh, remember the old Gene Kirkpatrick, democracies and double standards, or dictatorships and double standards or whatever it was, an explicit carve out for the Middle East. There's good dictators and bad dictators. Good dictators are pro-American, bad dictators need to be overthrown. And that's basically been pretty much the guiding principle of US foreign policy, it seems to me, throughout the Cold War and to the present day. Um, it was quite fascinating to me during Ukraine um, after the Russia's invasion of Ukraine, when uh, the Biden administration, in a policy that I very strongly supported, um, wanted to rally a global coalition around a rules-based liberal international order, um, and I think did a, a tremendous job of building a coalition with, with the European Union and European states, and kind of trying to build a whole set of global norms and practices where you would say, look, 
there's a thing which binds us together as an international community. We are in favor of democracy. We're against invading and conquering other countries, rules-based international order. We're going to promote democracy, and Ukraine is the cutting edge of that. And we couldn't get a single of our Middle Eastern allies to join us. Israel didn't, didn't vote for us. Saudi Arabia, the UAE didn't support us. None of our allies supported us. And one response to that might have been, hmm, that's a problem with our policies. Maybe we should change it. But uh, my, my old friend and a very, very savvy you know, Washington Middle East player, uh, Dennis Ross, uh, instead published uh, an influential article where he basically said, Actually, there's three kinds of states in the region. There's the liberal states that support the international order. There's the evil states like Russia. And then there's the useful Arab monarchies who really are better than anything else we could possibly hope for, so we should give them a pass. And I'm like, yeah, this is US foreign policy consistently all the way through. And that's kind of where, I, I think that's the other part of your answer uh, to, to your question. There's more to it than that, but I think that's enough. Yeah, yeah. Chris? Yeah, you can hear me now. Um, thanks so much for a fascinating talk. Um, I I wanted to ask. Um, I've, I've been thinking about this sort of escalation stuff as well, and I wanted to ask uh, about what you know about um, how much sort of a backroom diplomacy and communication is going on between um, the Israeli leadership and especially Egypt, uh, Jordan, and, and Lebanon. Um, I, I agree with your characterization of, of how we sort of got here with um, Hamas largely miscalculating about what kind of a response they would get to, uh, to the Oxo October 7th um, attacks. And the, the most likely route to escalation, right, it, to me is, is Israel not realizing what the red line is for uh, Egypt or, or Lebanon. So how do, do the leaders of those countries know what their red lines are, and are they communicating those to the Israelis or, or, or not? No, that, that, that's a great question, Chris. And so the answer to your question is yes and no, um, like, like, with, like with most questions. So the United States, you know, despite refusing to call for a ceasefire and doing a lot of things that I'm critical of, this has been their primary focus from the beginning, was to prevent regional escalation. And there's a reason why, uh, you know, Tony Blinken, Jake Sullivan, and and our, you know, kind of our all, our jack of all trades, what is the, whatever. Uh, Bill Burns is probably the best diplomat uh, the United States has, um, have been spending so much time in the region, shuttling back and forth from capital to capital, precisely for this, trying to encourage moderation, to avoid escalation. And this has been, from day one, this has been their primary focus, has been to try to avoid escalatory dynamics. And so, and one of the things which is interesting is that they're finding a very receptive audience. So if you were if you were alive and like paying attention to regional politics in kind of the late you know 2010s, you know during the Trump years, for example, you might have expected Saudi Arabia and the UAE to be foaming at the mouth for war with Iran. Like this is our moment. This is our chance to finally. No, they have been. No, we are, we, we're reconciling with Iran. This is rapprochement. We don't want war with Iran. Why? Because they know that they would be the first target of any kind of escalation. Uh, the, uh, the, the Saudis and the Emiratis were deeply affected by something which most Americans barely noticed, which was in 2019, uh, the Houthis uh, used drones to attack the Abqaiq oil refineries um, and basically took 40% of the world's oil offline um, uh, for a few days. And the Trump administration, the most hawkish anti-Iranian administration there's ever been or hopefully will ever be in the United States, didn't do anything about it. And the Saudis and the Emiratis are, wait a minute. You keep saying you want a war with Iran. You want to confront Iran. They attack us, and you don't defend us, even when they go after the oil of all things. I mean, if they killed our people, we'd understand you don't care. But they're going after the oil, and you're still not doing anything. That was extraordinarily sobering to them. And so most people point to the de-escalation in the Middle East when Biden won. And there's a lot to that. That's when the blockade of Qatar ended. That's when you saw a lot of the UAE de-escalating with, with Turkey and, with, and all that stuff. But I would say that the Upcake oil refinery attack was like the, the decisive moment in security terms when uh, the Gulf states said, wait a minute, war with Iran would actually be a disaster. So they've been getting, um, you know, kind of, the U.S. gets a receptive audience on that from the Gulf states, which you wouldn't necessarily have expected. 
on the, the red lines, Israel knows what those red lines are. The U.S. has communicated them extremely clearly and directly. The problem is that Israel doesn't have a functional government. And that what, is, what you see in Israel right now is a security establishment, which for the most part understands these things and is trying to carry out something like a war plan. And then you have a government of Netanyahu and, uh, and it's these core extreme right wing uh, figures who are the key to his political survival who don't agree with any of those things. If you listen to people like uh, Ben Zavir and uh, Smotrich, they want a regional war. They want to expel the Palestinians and annex the West Bank. They want to go after Hezbollah. The things which we are warning them against are the things that they want. Netanyahu knows better. Despite his reputation, he has always been an extremely cautious uh, figure in foreign policy. He has always tried to avoid uh, paying too heavy of, of a price for things. And you know, he's perfectly happy to come to you know, Congress and attack Obama over Iran, but he's been extremely cautious as a leader over the years in terms of actually starting wars. He's, much bigger, he's a much bigger fan of these like covert attacks and, sub, and sabotage and subterfuge and things like that. But Netanyahu isn't really in the driver's seat right now. It's the extreme right-wing ministers who, if they withdraw their support, his government collapses and he probably goes to prison. Um, that's what is the key wild card in all of this. Netanyahu, Yoav Gallant, the, the key security officials in Israel understand what would lead to escalation and for the most part are trying to avoid it, except in Gaza where they're doing unconscionable, unconscionable things, but they don't really want to expand. But it's not clear that they're ultimately making the decisions. And that's where, that's what keeps people up at night. And if you listen, if, I mean, just, I mean, literally just follow Ben Gavir's uh, uh, Twitter feed if you want nightmares. Uh, hi. So the other day I kind of saw in Michigan that Biden, I think, was projected to potentially lose Michigan in the 20, in the upcoming election. Like, do you think the risk of losing, like, the Arab American, Muslim American vote is going to put pressure on him or maybe influence Trump to, like, pursue some other policy? And with the war? Yeah, that's a, that's, that's a great question. And, you know, if you talk to the Biden people, what they will claim is that they are not interested, this is not about domestic politics, this is the U.S. strategic interest, and they try and, you know, put this in, in those kinds of terms. And it's been pretty clear that for Biden, uh, this really is something personal and that he's willing to pay domestic political costs for it. Um, but what, the, what the, um, the Arab American community did in Michigan was really quite remarkable. Um, and again, it doesn't, you know, for those of you who haven't followed it, they, they asked people in the Democratic primary to vote uncommitted rather than, rather than uh, vote for Biden. And they got over 100,000 votes, which is remarkable considering that uh, Biden only won Michigan by like 20,000 votes um, in, uh, in 2020. Um, the Biden political team is still working on the same theory of the case, which is that at the end of the day, Trump is so awful that everyone's gonna vote for me, and so we can safely ignore these things. Um, that's what they think. They think that um, when it comes down to it, even uh, people who are outraged over Gaza, no matter how angry they are, when they're faced with a theocratic restoration, a national abortion ban, um, Trump and all of his insanity coming back into the White House, They'll hold their noses and they'll vote blue. That, that's their theory of the case. I think they're wrong about very specific, like specific Arab American, Palestinian American communities in places like Michigan who've watched you know, their entire families be slaughtered. Um, I think they'll probably stay home. They might not vote for Trump, but they'll probably just stay home. Um, the question is whether there's enough of those to influence the outcome of the election. If it's a close election, the answer very well might be yes. And um, I think that that 100,000 uh, uncommitted votes definitely got their attention. Um, but the question is, the w what, what happens next? And I think that my reading of that campaign is that there's a certain group within them who are purists on this, and they're going to keep pushing and say, nobody ever vote for Biden under any circumstances, number, no matter what, because he authorized a genocide. And there's others who are saying, we did this to influence American policy, we got our message across, and now we wanna see if the Biden people will listen to us, and if they will, then we'll tell people to vote for him in November. Where, who carries the balance of that inside Arab American, Muslim American communities is not clear, and um, that, that's what will be tested.
I will say that um, the State Department, at least, and to some extent the White House, has reached out many times to progressive groups, to Muslim American groups, Arab American groups, um, and they listen to us. I've met with them many times um, in, in various capacities. But the issue is whether those ideas are transmitted up to influence policy. There's a, there's a massive frustration in the State Department that the White House just ignores everything that they say. I don't know if you noticed the dissent memos that got put out by uh, State Department staffers. There's a tremendous amount of dissatisfaction inside the US government with the idea being that policy is being concentrated in the Oval Office and a handful of officials and that the US government is not, like these kinds of engagement opportunities aren't really making a difference. So I don't know. I don't know if the domestic political risk will actually lead to a policy change or not. And I don't know if U.S. policy in Gaza could cost Biden the election. But both of those things seem at least plausible. Hi, thank you. Um, I've been sitting here thinking about how to frame my, uh, how to make this into a question. And I want to pick up on your last point, which is just, you know, really provides a segue in that um, you said that there's this sort of concentration of policy right inside the Oval Office in the White House. And so I've been sitting here thinking, how do I ask about the other actors? Because all of these leaders that you've mentioned are older men. And uh, there is agency for women in the Middle East. There's agency for, uh, there's a generational uh, gap that is quite different from this country. And so in, um, listening to a very interesting, and I mean this terribly um, respectfully, but uh, listening to a very interesting analysis, I'm not hearing anything about the agency of all these other actors who do have agency, even if we don't tend to see them as the major players, there is, they are still players. No, it's a, no it's, it's a great point, and one of the things in the, in the situation of Gaza, and I'm sure you probably feel this yourself, is the absolute helplessness that people feel. I mean, I mean, my God, what's happening in Gaza right now? And you know, th these are things which we all kind of in our naivete believed that the world would never allow to happen, and yet they just keep happening. And so it is kind of hard to locate agency in a world where nothing seems to matter. Where I mean, you could have uh, Jan Egelund, who's uh, one of the absolute most experienced uh, uh, humanitarian uh, people, you know, humanitarian leaders in the world goes to Gaza, comes back yesterday, and says, my entire career, I've never seen anything like this before. This can't be allowed to continue. There's no impact. So in terms of you know, what you're asking, in terms of where is the agency uh, of women in particular, um, if you look in the campaign that, that, that he was asking about, um, that many of the, I'm sorry, let me stay close. Um, many of the leaders of that campaign are women, uh, Palestinian activists who've been working on this uh, for, for you know, many, many, many years have really taken the lead. If you look at, for example, uh, someone like Nora Erekat, uh, who's a, kind of a leading Palestinian intellectual, she's been out there speaking, pushing out against, uh, uh, against uh, prevailing narratives, and, they've, and I think people like that have made a huge impact. There's a whole group of kind of young Palestinian activists who came to international attention in 2021 during uh, the Sheikh Jarrah, uh, you know, the campaign there, um, and they've been, you know, you've seen people like Mohammed Al-Khurd and people like that. They've been, you know, they've been able to get into the media in ways that I think in the past they might not have been able to. So there's definitely that kind of, you know, kind of agency within kind of public discourse and social media, within kind of mainstream journalism. I mean, yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, some of the most important and, uh, and uh, uh, kind of influential journalists working in the Middle East are women across the board. But of course, there's been a, bla a blanket uh, blockade on journalist access to Gaza, which is just, again, unprecedented. And uh, only a couple days ago was there finally a letter uh, signed by like 50 different uh, uh, kind of media organizations demanding access. But that's been something which has blocked it. But I think that in general, where you're finding that kind of agency is going to be at the level of popular mobilization and public discourse, Policy is, as you said, uh, overwhelmingly uh, dominated by these kind of old men. 
And in the Middle East, we're talking about authoritarian systems, which uh, there's an extreme concentration of power. Um, all, of, all of that is male um, and old. <laughs> now, I mean, there's been a generational change in many of the, in many of the Arab regimes. But um, if, you look at, uh, uh, if you look at Israel, you've got Netanyahu, you've got the, the ministers. You had this incredibly potent, powerful protest movement against Netanyahu uh, in 2022, 2023, which has kind of sputtered out since October 7th, and they haven't really been able to revitalize it in the face of what has happened to Israeli public opinion since then. Um, and uh, yeah, but it, it, it is hard to locate um, the kind of thing you're talking about at the decision of policymaking. You have to go outside of policy circles to really see it happening. But again, this like the, 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 the campaign in Michigan, that's a good example of where you can see um, things happening. The ICC, uh, not the ICC, but the International Court of Justice. I mean, you look at the, um, the agency there lies with the global south. I mean, South Africa stepping forward and bringing that case to the ICJ. If you look at the, the various uh, uh, countries which stepped forward and gave uh, depositions in support of that case, um, you know, there you can see agency outside of the great powers, outside of the West. Um, and so that, but you really have to look at those other, at those other arenas beyond kind of the, the region, uh, kind of great power politics. Um, yeah, no, I mean, and, and uh, but I, I, I think I speak for them and for myself in just the, the sheer level of frustration. And it's like, I almost wrote this in my blog this morning and then deleted it. And it's just like, you know, why bother? It's like, we write these, we write these op-eds, we write these policy memos, nothing changes. And just looking at what's happening to, to people in Gaza, it's just, again, it's like you, you can hardly believe that this is happening under full lights where you have, there's absolutely no way for anyone to deny what is happening. With the sheer circulation of videos on social media, the stories, the testimonies, we know with 100%, maybe not 100%, but with enough clarity. Um, what's going on, and yet it doesn't seem to matter. This idea that, um, and that you could have, you know, we, we had this enormous debate, as you might remember, about who actually bombed this one hospital in, in, uh, in Gaza. And this went on for a week, for two weeks, and forensic examinations of was it an Islamic Jihad missile, was it an Israeli shell? Meanwhile, Israel has demolished like 20 hospitals in Gaza in their entirety. And people still argue about that one incident. And it just becomes incredibly frustrating sometimes. But we can't give up. I mean, obviously, that's why we do what we do, is to try and change the world, make it a better place. But uh, this is testing, I think, the, um, the ability of many people to kind of stay within the, uh, the bounds of the normal. I don't know how many of you saw uh, this tragic uh, uh, young, young, uh, young man who lit himself on fire outside the Israeli embassy, um, and this is that—that that is desperation of the inability to make any changes through normal institutional channels. And again, I think in the Washington bubble that uh, I'm, I'm a little bit insulated from now, having lived in Ohio for three months. But that's still my world, and there, I think there's still a set, a bit of denial. There's a bubble about how intense the feelings about Gaza are not just in the Arab world, but globally. And I, I think that people just don't really quite get it, even now. Uh, this is perhaps a little outside the mainstream of the previous mm -hmm. questions, but uh, the US Navy has a, a mission to keep open the uh, sea lanes of commerce, wherever they may be. And mm -hmm little bit of an atypical mission because it benefits other countries and even some that may not particularly like us uh, as well as ourselves. But our ships are over there in the Gulf of Suez and at least part of their presence there is under the auspices of that mission. Mm -hmm. But the commerce that goes through there uh, is, or the, the, the effects on the commerce from what the Houthis are doing is surely affecting many countries throughout the world, in, in Europe, uh, China. Why does it seem like it's our total responsibility to keep a handle on that? Why is it yeah. so hard for us to get partners in the effort to uh, you know, be able to, to keep uh, commerce flowing through that area, through the Suez Canal? 
No, that's a great question. And um, I think one the, the reason why you're not seeing more Middle Eastern partners other than Bahrain um, is simply that uh, with public opinion so fully inflamed uh, the way I've been describing, no government wants to risk being seen as doing something which is to Israel's benefit. And so they're happy to sit this out even though they are among the most affected by the, um, the impact on shipping. Um, I would say that there's two levels to your question I'd like to address. The first is about the United States. And I think that this has been, in many ways, the foundation of US global primacy, right? We provide the public goods, um, and that basically backs up our claim to global leadership. And so we have always, excuse me, we've always legitimated our global primacy in those terms. So in terms of you know, keeping global shipping lanes open, that is something which demonstrates the value of American leadership, right? Because it's a public good from which everybody benefits. We're willing to pay those costs in exchange for the legitimation of our leadership position. What's really interesting in this case, and I think this is kind of where your question is coming from, is that and I'm just gonna like re make this really simple, is that the primary destination for a great deal of what passes through both the Persian Gulf and through the, the Red Sea is China. And China has been making a determined effort at making inroads into the Middle East for the last 10 years. Washington has, at least until October 7th, almost defined its policies in the Middle East around contesting the increase of Chinese um, presence and contesting Chinese influence as part of this global struggle against China. And, um, and yet, in this moment when China should be positioned to you know, assert itself in the region, the US is incredibly unpopular, direct Chinese national interests are threatened, they've done almost nothing. And people in the Gulf are noticing. Um, you know, my initial expectation would be that China, and I, this was one of my expectations back you know, a couple months ago, was that China was going to take full advantage of this, that this would be a decisive tipping point moment in which um, US you know, kind of basically was demonstrated, you know, its, its alliance with Israel was going to become too great of a cost, and that China would step forward and aggressively position itself as a mediator, um, and kind of this might be the moment when, you know, again, if, they are if the Houthis are blockading things that are primarily going to China, then if China has naval assets, this is the time to use them. That's what great powers do, right? They use their assets in order to protect vital national interest. And Chinese deference to the United States be, and, and its willingness to let the US pay those costs seems like an abdication of aspirations towards becoming a, a Middle Eastern power. Um, and uh, certainly, that's they've underperformed based on what I expected. Now, some people are arguing that this is, again, a savvy move on their part. Basically, this is the, the time-honored uh, uh, you know, you know, thing. This is kind of something that Trump would have brought up. Would be to say, you know, U.S. is the sucker here. You know, the China's like, sure, if you if you want to pay to do this, we'll let you. Why should we waste our resources on something that you're willing to do? Um, and they might be right about that. Um, the question is whether that comes with any trade-offs in terms of the willingness of states in the region to consider China to be an alternative um, as a provider of security or as a political uh, alliance partner. So I would say that the answer that you would get in Washington to, to your direct question would be, we are proving that we are willing to pay those costs, and that is what cements our alliance with the, those key states in the Gulf. And we are basically juxtaposing ourselves to China to show that we will do what they will not do. Um, and that would be the kind of strategic answer that you would get. Whether that's right or not, I don't know. But I mean, that's the answer that they would give. Um, the alternate answer, again, is that China is simply playing a long game, letting the US beat itself up and pay the cost, and then is positioning itself to step in um, when everything goes south, as it kind of is. Related to the last question, over the past few days, U.S. Senators, notably on Senate Foreign Relations Committee like Tim Kaine or Chris mm -hmm. Murphy, have been more critical of the Biden administration's policy towards Yemen strikes. Specifically, they're looking for more congressional approval or an authorization on those. So I'm curious what you think or how you see 
the foreign policy debate between the legislative and ex executive branch playing out over the next coming weeks or coming months? Yeah, this has been a deep and perennial issue in U.S. foreign policy. We're still we're still fighting these wars based on the 2001 uh, AUMF, which is completely ridiculous. Um, I mentioned this base in Tomf in uh, southern Syria, and that was authorized as part of the war against ISIS. And now it's explicitly an anti-Iranian mission, but it's never been authorized in that way. Um, and that was a big deal, you know, you know, you know, seven or eight years ago. Uh, again, with many of the same senators and the like. I would say that in general, um, I tend to be, I, I'm not an American, American politics guy. Um, I tend to see that uh, we live in a system where the executive actually does what it wants to do on foreign policy and views Congress primarily as an obstacle to get around. Um, I think that the uh, current uh, congressional Republican hold on aid to Ukraine and Israel is one of the more remarkable things that I've ever seen in that domain where they're actually um, impeding uh, a top uh, a presidential priority and there doesn't seem to be a way for Biden to get around it. Um, if, if you remember way back in uh, the 1980s when uh, Congress uh, passed the Bolin Amendment to prevent uh, the United States from providing aid to the Contras in uh, Nicaragua, uh, the Reagan administration simply concocted one of the greatest schemes in the history of American foreign policy where it um, sold weapons to Iran in exchange for the release of hostages um, held in Lebanon and then illegally sent the proceeds uh, of those sales to the Contras. Um, completely circumventing uh, the congressional branch. Back then, we saw that as a scandal, and um, some people actually got in trouble for it a little bit, although they're all back in office and stuff, so it didn't hurt them too much. But back then, you know, that, that, that's kind of how we dealt with those sorts of things. These days, um, you know, it's, it's been th this, the hold on, on, on Ukraine aid, I think Israel's a, just a casual, kind of a, 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 what do you call that, a um, collateral damage in that, uh, it's really about Ukraine. But um, that's been kind of remarkable. But the difference between what the senators you're talking about are doing and what the House uh, Republicans are doing is that the House controls the purse strings. And they actually control the money. Um, so basically, the, the attitude of the White House is that Tim Kaine can say whatever he wants to do. He can't stop them. Um, and that's, that was the position under Trump, that was the position under Obama, that was the position under Clinton, that's the position under Biden, basically the concentration of power in the White House on foreign policy. Um, and I don't see that likely to change, whereas the House getting involved does seem to be qualitatively different, and I have no idea how that's going to play out. With that, I, I should stop talking <laughs> since there, there's, actual, there's actual experts on U.S. foreign policy making in the room, so I should let them answer that question. <laughs> Very sadly, we have reached the end of our time. B oh, okay, sorry. One, one quick question, one last question. Thank you. Um, fairly simple question. If, 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 as you've stated in your recent article, that the two-state solution is effectively impossible at this point, um, and your prescription is to insist that Israel um, honor human rights for Palestinians under their control, what leverage would you apply if they just flip the bird and say, no? <laughs> yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's a great question. Um, and so one of the things which is most misunderstood about that, that this article, and even more so the one we published last year called The One State Reality, is people think that we're advocating for a one-state solution, uh, like a binational one-state solution. Um, I actually think that's impossible. I think there's no chance that's gonna happen. Um, the difference between me and a lot of other people is simply that the reality that we have is this one-state reality. And you know, the Foreign Affairs just published a symposium based on our, on our piece. Um, and Martin Index piece about the two-state solution, and they asked a bunch of experts, you know, is a two-state solution still possible? And the and there were about half the people said, yes, it's still possible. So I was curious, okay, so these are experts and they look at the same world I do, so what, what's their rationale? And overwhelmingly, their rationale was the two-state solution has to still be possible because there's no other alternative. It has to be. I'm like, well, but it's not. And they're like, no, because any other possible solution would be normatively terrible. It would be domination. Israel wouldn't still be democratic, or it still wouldn't be, or wouldn't still be Jewish, and all these things. 
And again, I keep saying, yes, you're right, but it's not possible. And not a single one of them offered an argument to show why it would actually still be possible under these conditions. So come back around to your question. What do you actually do about it? And here, you know, as with, uh, as with the, this like feeling of impossibility and frustration that we have in so many ways, um, you know, the starting point is would simply be recognizing that reality and treating Israel like you would any other state, and simply say, look, you know, we have expectations of our country, uh, we have expectations of our allies and friends that they will be democratic, they will respect human rights and civil rights, and we actually have laws about how to how to, we you know whether we can sell weapons to countries that abuse human rights, um, you know, and and that sort of thing, and I think. You know, basically, just start by that. You know, basically, we had a very in the in the in this particular foreign affairs article. I think we had an extremely modest um, set of asks because we recognize that not that bigger things aren't going to happen. So we're not asking for Israel to be singled out. We're not asking for any of the you know any of the sorts of things which I think pe many people would like to see. We're simply saying be consistent. Treat Israel like you would any other state. If they carry out war crimes, have them be prosecuted for war crimes and don't sell them weapons because we actually have laws on the books that say you cannot sell weapons to countries that carry out war crimes. So respect our own laws. Um, if they're brought forward to the International Criminal Court, Inter International Court of Justice, let justice play out. Let them be treated like any other country and don't defend them on those bases. Um, and kind of, kind of across the board along that way, we're simply saying stop, the, stop treating Israel as exceptional, stop pretending there's a two-state possibility, and start looking at the reality as it is and insisting that it kind of mirror our values of justice and, and equality. And the, 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 the worst thing that, not, not to this article, um, very few people actually are really still believe in the two-state solution. So the response to this article has been relatively muted. But in the one-state reality piece, we got a lot of people you know, attacking us and you know, saying, this is a call for the destruction of Israel as a Jewish state. It's anti-Semitic. It's like this is a, a call for the destruction of the state of Israel. And this, this, this boggles my mind. If, if, if your interpretation of provide equal civil and human rights to all people under your power means the destruction of your state, that says something about your state. And that is something which I, I have a really hard time with in terms of the idea that um, you can have this notion that simply respecting civil and human rights is in some way a violent act against the survival of the state shouldn't be the case. It should simply be, this is the Israel which, um, which would honor the values of the founders of Israel, and this should be something which used to be quite common on the Israeli left until this sharp right turn that's been taken in recent decades. Um, this was the motivation behind the Oslo process in the first place, the response to the Intifada in 1987, um, the idea that you had to have two-state solution in order to maintain you know, Israel as a Jewish and democratic state. That seemed, used to be an extremely mainstream position within, within Israel, but it no longer is. And I think that's kind of all we're trying to do right now is to get people to recognize where we've gotten to and how bad that really is. Um, whether that can be done with the resources that the U.S. is both either capable or willing to, um, to deploy, I doubt it. I, I really doubt it. I think the most likely, this is why I said we're not really advocating a one-state solution, because I think the most likely outcome is a continuation of the current trajectory, which is the consolidation of this, what seems to me, a manifestly unjust system of uh, kind of the domination of of non-Jewish citizens and non-Jewish um, re and Palestinian residents of the West Bank and Gaza, kind of not in, not forever, but in the you know the short to midterm future, and that just strikes me as a terrible outcome. So I wish I had a good answer for you because we all confront the same thing, um, but what we do know is that the United States is the key to maintaining that that those systems, and if the U.S. doesn't act in a different way, then nothing will happen. That doesn't mean the U.S. acting will necessarily change er everything, but it does mean without the U.S. acting, there's a guarantee that nothing will change. With that modest proposal, we must bring it to a close. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for your questions. Please thank our speakers.